Good morning. I'd like to call the Wednesday meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education meeting to order. I'll just tell you today at this meeting, I am using a gavel that was used by my father when he was chair of the Wichita Board of Education back in the 1960s. So I thought for my last meeting that might be appropriate to use today. So we are going to call the meeting to order today, the Wednesday meeting. Again, we are meeting remotely, uh, and we are meeting remotely because of the restrictions in Shawnee County. Uh, so we would be unable to meet in person in Shawnee County. So we are having to meet remotely. I know we would all rather meet re meet, meet in person up in Shawnee County, but we just are unable to do so today. I would like to note that all board members are present today online uh, in Zoom. So would like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, also that the... Uh, Meeting today is being uh, live streamed via YouTube for the public. So I'd like to uh, welcome the folks that are watching and listening online. Uh, okay, we'd like to uh, do approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to today's agenda? And if not, I'd take a motion to approve. Okay, Dina Horst moves to approve today's agenda. A second by Jean Clifford. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that's a 10-0 with Ben's arm in the picture. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, the first agenda item today, we're very happy to welcome uh, to our meeting today, the uh, Literacy Network of Kansas, which is doing their annual performance evaluation today. And this is for the 2019-20 school year. And this is for the Striving Readers uh, Implementation Grant uh, we, I know we heard from you last year, and we're excited to hear and get a continuation of your results. And I believe, Kimberly Muff, you're starting this off today. So welcome, and you can introduce your co-presenters also. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, if I may, may I uh, share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Is that showing correctly now? Yes. Okay. I'd like to um, provide you with a message of celebration uh, today with our link schools. And this is also a message of hope, um, of guiding students amidst some very unusual times. And today we're celebrating the work of link districts um, to improve literacy in their communities, which all started with good planning. In 2012, KSD developed a literacy guide with a team of literacy experts and educators. The Kansas Guide to Literacy was revised in 2017 and a needs assessment was created at that time to provide districts with an ability to define their literacy needs. Uh, those needs can span a really wide range with evidence-based practices, uh, family and community partnerships, professional development, and instructional resources for literacy development. And with that statewide literacy plan in place and a team of people whom I respect very much, KSDE received a $27 million plus federal Striving Readers grant. In 2018, districts and education service centers applied for this grant to become a part of the Literacy Network of Kansas, which we term LINK. And eight projects were awarded, and these are those eight projects representing 190 schools in 32 districts across Kansas. This has now become a very collaborative group of schools. Our LINK leaders mentor and share with each other the activities and the resources that have been made available with their LINK funds. Planning and implementation activities have helped administrators and educators in these districts to forge ahead when things got tough last spring. After only two years in implementation, we now have online professional development in place, educators with experience in using student data to deliver instruction in multiple modes, including online, and more community and family partnerships than ever with these districts. Your annual report, which is included in your board packet, summarizes many of these districts from all of the LINK projects. So today I'd like to introduce two projects 
who will give you an overview of their success with LINK. Um, they use their specific needs assessment, their solid planning, and now they have the knowledge and resources in place for this year, which is the third and final year of the grant cycle. I'd like to introduce Monica Mernan. She's the Director of Community Support with the Southeast Kansas Education Service Center, or Greenbush, and she'll discuss how their districts have impacted literacy development with district continuous improvement. And I am going to stop sharing my screen now and allow Monica to speak on behalf of the Greenbush 16 District Consortia. Monica. Thanks, Kim. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. Um, I'm coming to you from Pittsburgh. As you well know, our main campus at Greenbush is located outside of Girard. Um, for those of you a little more familiar with Southeast Kansas, just right by St. Paul. And so one of the things that we had as a opportunity and a challenge for us from the very beginning of this process, um, which has turned out to be an incredible gift, is our farthest north district in this um, process is in Hiawatha, and the farthest south is Riverton. So any of you who are familiar with the eastern side of the state, we're on the road quite a bit. Luckily, the work that we did in year one and year two really helped us in year three as we had to adapt how we did everything in our grants and how we had to adapt our support to those 16 districts. So um, what I wanted to share with you today is just a, a simple concept that has seemed to work well for us as we have tried to bring our districts along in specifically their literacy instruction. So oftentimes, we, um, when we talk about professional development, we really kind of talk about the surface of things. I was able to go something, I heard something new, I made some changes in my classroom, those kinds of things, which is, you know, the natural first step. But what we've tried to do in our LINK projects is develop systems so that when this federal money goes away and the resources of Greenbush that have been provided through the grant go away, a district shouldn't know the difference. That has been our mantra from day one. As I speak to superintendents, I say, use this three years as an opportunity to build up your big old wish list and to get things done that you've needed to get done or had thought about getting done or didn't even know you should get done as it relates to literacy supports. What I mean by that is, are your folks who are going to professional development making a change in the classroom when they come back in a way that is evidence-based, in a way that is focused and aligned with what your district's plan is to move children along in their literacy development? So one thing that we put into place that really seemed to move districts in year two was just a simple concept of district leadership teams. Oftentimes when you have a grant project, you have your, you know, first to sign up folks, you know, we all have them. Um, and when it comes to professional development, we have our first to sign up folks. But what we encouraged in our leadership teams was to widen that circle and bring in more people. We were successful in all of our districts in doing that. And the ones that really bought into the concept um, have seen really significant changes in things like when we do professional development locally or planning, what does, are we really digging in and talking about where kids are and their reading skills? When we look at how we um, discuss data or even have access to data, are we doing that in a significant and meaningful way? We have also really shifted the conversation through those teams when we talk about evaluation. So, of course, every federal grant application and, and, and award has a large evaluation process. And most of the time, a lot of us don't really see that as the, the thing that we should be thinking about first. But what we've done through these district leadership teams is to embed that evaluation on a daily basis so that we really are talking about continuous improvement and not just a report that's due at the end of the year. So an example of that would be we have done things like team functioning surveys. So we have measured on these teams using a list of uh, what we know to be evidence-based effective change processes. Um, we have measured, has your team improved in their functioning 
over the years. And that becomes part of our evaluation. We also have used um, specific surveying for um, our, our teachers. Have they changed behaviors in the classroom? Another important thing that I want to let you know about is we didn't focus just on those pre-K through third grade teachers. We um, have had a really successful process with our career and technical education teachers, our secondary teachers, using a concept called down and dirty. You know, the, the I never really learned how to teach a kid to read, but I've got this 10th grader that's struggling in, in um, a career and technical education path because of that. What can I do? Um, to help move that along. So by continually swirling around and picking up more teachers, we have, have seen that work. And by using a district leadership team process and specific meeting agendas, we've been able to pick some more folks up. So enter into year three and a whole new world, as everyone knows. But what we have seen is that, that te those teams are continuing to stay in place. And even if they're over Zoom or however they are, and we're having less conversations about where are we going to do the PD, where are we going to do the meeting, and more conversations about what is happening in this building or that building as it relates to kids and their reading. So we have... Um, it's not a new or, or fancy process, but we sure have seen it make an impact in our 16 districts as we move forward. So Kim, what we're focused, the next steps that we're focusing on, and I think you've got my slide there, is so for the rest of this year, we just see this, if you guys work at all with uh, the Office of Recovery and the Office of Transport, or Department of Transportation, they have countdown clocks for everything. That's what we're, <laughs> we see a clock ticking away until the end of this three-year process at the end of June. So that clock is, we hear it, all of us hear it, our coaches hear it, our lead people hear it at the district level. So um, we are keeping things simple, continue the process that worked in year two, embed it, embed it so that when the money's gone and the supports are gone, you don't know any different. That's the goal. Handing off the leadership. So where we um, at Greenbush have kind of pushed and pulled in different places, whether it's at a building admin level or at a district level or at a teacher level, we're slowly handing that leadership off. And in many places, it has been handed off. We are simply a resource at this point, which is good, right? There's no need to go run the clock down completely. The other thing that we are focusing on as it relates to collaboration. We know none of this works in isolation. One of the things that I do believe we've moved all of our districts on is the idea that literacy is not K-12. It's sure not K-4, right? And so we have grown exponentially in most of our districts, their relationship with early childhood, zero to five, we have focused on family literacy and that focus has gotten even stronger in year three as we move away from an event, family literacy, family engagement event type of thinking to how do we engage constantly and how do we engage in a way that's meaningful and it's just not me sending you social media posts or sending you emails. So that um, capacity is, is growing and feel really, really good about that. We're also growing that team approach within buildings. As with any project, there's always a group that says, well, this isn't really my deal. This is really an elementary deal. Mm. That's not flying. And so looking at how within buildings, we're growing these concerted efforts and marrying it with accreditation or marrying it with MTSS and not just seeing this as a separate thing to click off. And then finally, that natural flow of reading interventions. And what I mean by that is, are we seriously looking at our data for our kids are we looking at how those interventions match up with that data? And are we moving past the logistics of intervention into the daily work of those interventions? And it's a day after day after day process. So with that, I'll be quiet and, and would be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thanks, Monica. Uh, we are very fortunate to have wonderful leadership across all of our link districts. Uh, Monica Mernan and Tracy Hinman, and 
or the leadership for Greenbush, and they manage 16 different school districts, which is a huge task. And um, they've done wonderful work there as evidenced um, by a lot of their evaluation results. So I'd like to now introduce Garden City's leadership team, uh, Monica Diaz and Nick Pashik and Mary Carlin. And they will talk about their professional learning and how community engagement is supporting literacy within the Garden City Schools. And I'm going to keep it on the screen share as um, we've got some slides that they'll be going through. Monica? Okay. Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present. The link grant has provided us with many opportunities to enrich the education of our students and the development of the teachers in Garden City. Today, I'm going to highlight two of these areas. Um, the next slide. In the area of professional development, you will see that we have created a platform to deliver data-driven professional development that includes in-person and on-demand models. We have been able to offer a plethora of book studies as well as two summer learning summits. In addition, the LEAP grant allowed us to hire a technology integrationist, which we knew would be helpful in presenting all of our professional development, but never realized the key role he would play for teachers teaching during a pandemic. This requires remote learning and conferencing as a necessity. In order to say that our professional development is data driven, we refer to the research of John Hattie. When you look at the effect sizes of the teaching strategies presented in Hattie's visible learning diagram, collective teacher efficacy with the effect size of 1.57 is the number one influence related to student achievement. We have targeted professional development around this strategy as well as teacher clarity with an effect size of 0.75 and formative assessments with an effect size of 0 0.70. Even though we were in the midst of a statewide shutdown, we were able to have multiple experts still present to our staff via Zoom. Do you have a summit when no one can come? Not normally, but if you have a technology integrationist who knows about technology and instruction, you can. Our technology integrationist is Nick Pashik. Never having had a technology integrationist, we didn't fully know what to expect. On the left side, you will see what we intended his role to be. On the right side, you will see how Nick's job has expanded, not just because we needed it to, but because it had to. His position has become a necessity in the remote learning environment. This is how we organize, you'll see a widget. This is how we organize the book studies in our district so that teachers have access to book studies happening now. They can click on a title and they'll know how many professional development points they will earn other schools that have participated in this book study, and they can even sign up directly from this page on Power Learning, which is our professional development platform. Nick also designs flyers for our training to encourage teachers to participate in personalized learning based on their student needs and their personal or professional goals. In addition, we provide an on-demand catalog of self-paced trainings. This, screen sh this screenshot shows English language arts professional development, including the title of the professional development, how many minutes it will take to complete, and how many points they will receive. On this next slide, we'll see how our professional development platform works. You'll see how they can search for a course, play a video, and begin their training. So that's just a little scenario of how they might look for professional development and view their video. 
Upon completion, they will be directed to a survey where they state how this knowledge will help them in their current job assignment and for documenting salary advancement. Here you will see a sampling of live training that is recorded and now available on, for on-demand training. On-demand training benefits teachers and administrators. Every year we have to revisit content with new staff. On-demand training is cost-effective and provides flexibility. Because of the pandemic, we have had to learn to teach remotely. This includes studio setups and use of equipment needed to do, needed to do this job. For example, Sling Studio is a portable multi-camera hardware and software program our teachers use for instruction. Here you can see a sixth grade teacher using a studio to deliver instruction to her students. There should be sound, but I don't. It's fine, the video shows you how, kind of like a weather forecaster um, has different things pop up on her screen. That's kind of how this, this works as well. Okay. Mary Carlin is our family and community engagement liaison. You can see that we have been able to develop quite a few relationships in our community. We have sponsored guest authors, provided manipulatives and materials for purposeful play. We have startup libraries and books to our, and given out books to our many community partners, as well as private in-home daycares. Parent engagement was an important area that we supported through LINK. We had scholastic education training for parent liaisons and administrators from each building. They also administered family engagement assessments to measure a school's capacity for developing effective partnerships with families and recommended solutions for enriching family engagement practices. These assessments covered the areas of parent welcoming, communication, information and participation. We have mobile kiosks provided to providing brief videos in four different languages on a variety of child development areas such as developmental milestones, reading aloud, and the can't wait to read campaign. Our on-demand professional development videos purchased and created with Link Money will continue to provide necessary training to our new staff, as well as refresher courses for returning staff, including long-term substitutes and support staff. Community and family engagement will continue through the support of available grants, community partnerships, and district support. And we wanna thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, uh, we will try to answer those. Thanks so much uh, to Greenbush and uh, Garden City. Um, th they really have been working hard. Who, who knew um, the kinds of things that we would be utilizing in this year as a result of LINK? And, and a, a lot of that is uh, the, that district-wide support and online professional development and resources in, in all of those projects. Um, all of our projects across Kansas have been I'm working very hard and a copy of the annual report um, is available. Um, and so at that, I would like to stop share and we're available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for both groups for uh, Greenbush, which would represent, I'm sure, many, many small districts and for Garden City, you're a pretty good sized district. Uh, so really be able to show uh, two different approaches to how you're doing that, uh, using that link network. Uh, that's pretty exciting stuff. So I'm sure the board members have some questions. So board members, questions? Because if you don't, I do. Jean Clifford? I was just wondering, cons considering how successful this program is, is there any opportunity to um, 
renew or continue this type of a grant program and maybe expand it to other districts? That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Um, the new iteration of Striving Readers is now called the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Program, another acronym, CLSD. Um, those um, legislative funding was in place last year and funded 10 projects um, across the United States and within territories. And um, we have already put together a work team at KSDE to begin preparation um, in case the funding is available for that program again this next year. Um, it, typically, the, uh, the announcement, the federal announcement has come out in April and typically they've been awarded in June. So our plan is to have everything in place um, to apply for the uh, comprehensive literacy program in April should that opportunity arise with funding. Other questions, board members? Mr. Porter? Yes, you know, there's been a great deal of emphasis recently, and, and everybody will be surprised if I don't ask this question. Uh, there's been a great deal of emphasis uh, from the legislative task force on dyslexia and their recommendations. Is there any coordination or relationship between those recommendations and this program? I appreciate you asking that question as well. So Cindy Haddocky, who is our elementary consultant, 25% uh, of her time is actually paid by this LINK grant. And um, we collaborate on a daily, weekly basis. 96% um, of our funds go out to the um, projects as subgrantees. So uh, KSDE only holds 4% of all of that $27 million link fund, which essentially is personnel. But because we were unable to travel and do a lot of conferences, we um, have funding this year. And the recommendations put, set, set forth by the Dyslexia Committee um, to uh, have a, a band of courses in structured literacy for uh, teachers of English, to, um, elementary teachers and specified teachers within the Dyslexia Initiative. Um, we're using our KSDE side of the funding to put together 12 structured literacy modules um, using experts in the field, some of our staff here at K um, KSDE, um, some, uh, some partners that we have with TASN and um, other literacy experts and developing 12 uh, structured literacy modules that we're piloting with Link Schools this year. Those will be online um, through the Teaching and Leading website, and then those will be available statewide um, beginning next fall. So yes, we're coordinating as when you know as many ways as we can to uh, use those green or use our Link districts as as pilots for things that we would want to continue in the future statewide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, board members? Well, my question is, um, you know, one of your years obviously was uh, taken up with uh, having to go to a very different type of instruction. So as we have been working through the pandemic time, what lessons have you learned within the pandemic of how you've had to function that you feel like you can move forward with and continue um, when we, when we go back to whatever our new normal is. I'd like to actually ask either Greenbush or Garden City to answer that because again, I think it goes back to that strong system support and, um, and, and then having opportunities for professional development online, which this grant has afforded that opportunity through, you know, hiring technology integrationists and things like that. So I'll open that up for Greenbush or Garden City to answer if you'd like. That'd be good to hear from both of them because they serve different types of districts. So that'd be great. I'd like to uh, throw out that we have used the pandemic to our advantage and we have used, because we're focused on change, we have used the excuse of the pandemic in many, many cases after we worked through the initial shock of it. And one thing that we have learned, and we have known this forever, is that paraprofessionals work most closely with kids who are struggling with reading, and we don't train them. 
And so we have really encouraged our districts to include all paras, whether they're employed through the special education cooperative or um, from the district themselves. This summer, uh, right before school was out, we used the excuse of you have paras and they're available. We did a series of 16 one hour webinars that were designed specifically for paraprofessionals working with young kids and older kids too. And we just put a, a, a message out saying, hey, these are here and they're, they're available. By the end of the week, our Zoom capacity was 500 and we had so many of our sessions max out at 500 paraprofessionals on from across the state that we almost had a little bit of mutiny going on. And uh, we felt like we were kind of running a rock concert and tickets were selling out. And so one of the things that we've learned from that is we need to quit overthinking things, right? We just need to say, what are the basics we need to get to and how do we get to them? Quit thinking about events, quit thinking about what you're gonna serve people at lunch, right? And, and just do it and put it out there and make it bite sized And that has really, really helped us. The other thing I would say we have learned from the pandemic is we have to engage with families, families as defined by whoever loves that kid, right? Whoever it is. And um, it has forced us to go away from what I mentioned before, the event type theory. We have a math night and you need to come to a more meaningful um, engagement with families. Because let's face it, we're in their houses now, right? They, we, there's a different level of trust and interaction right now. And we need to, to build up on that. So those have been a couple things um, that we have seen. Um, in Garden City, I would think through the pandemic, professional development is probably one of, uh, and that was one of the target areas we presented. But um, being able to provide remote professional development has really been a benefit. It's a lot easier for staff to attend professional development via Zoom. Um, we also have our catalog of over 300 now professional development opportunities recorded. So this on-demand um, idea, we knew we wanted, but like it's so important now because of the pandemic and we can't be together for professional development. People can go home, um, put their children to bed, pick a professional development, um, professional development opportunity and do that in the comfort of their own home, which before we didn't, we weren't there yet. So um, this opportunity to do on demand and, and go through a catalog and, and figure out what your, uh, either your student needs are or professional or personal goals that a teacher might have and uh, be able to pick and choose some recorded sessions that we've been able to offer, I think has really, uh, really grown and blossomed through this pandemic. Yeah, I would think that would probably be, have been a real plus for you guys, especially this last, uh, well, so far nine months that you've been able to provide this uh, real time, but also on demand type of professional development and tailored to the people's needs. Cause uh, you know, one of you mentioned earlier, you may be teaching uh, English language arts teachers at the secondary level, their needs are going to be different than our elementary teachers. So I think being able to really tailor that to needs is uh, probably something you've really, I bet you've gotten pretty good at. And I would have guessed you'll probably take that forward. At least I would hope so. And other folks, I'm sure, will do the same thing. Other questions, board members? Uh, Randy? I want to thank Kim and, and everyone for not only the grant, but the opportunities that we've had. I think um, both Garden City and NASDAQ said it well. Jim Porter knows this. Kim and Cindy Hadicke know it. I, teachers are just thirsty for good literacy. You, you would think, I think common, just people would say, well, teachers, they know how to teach literacy. They know how to teach reading. I'm talking all the way down to pre-K. They want the best research. They want to continue to hone their craft. And you can see that by what they've said about the staff development. So 
Um, this, this will go on for a long time and just want to thank everyone's efforts, whether it's been on the grant, dyslexia, or just in good staff development related to literacy. Thank you. Any further questions, board members? Well then on behalf of the board, we do want to thank uh, Kim, you and your team. Uh, uh, we appreciate the presentation today and uh, really showing the resilience of how do we provide that good professional development uh, despite of our circumstances and probably learn some good lessons as we move forward. So thank you and uh, continue to do the good work. I know you will. We appreciate your efforts. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, provide a report today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, moving to our next agenda item. Uh, we are going to uh, spend a little bit of time today. We've got a good amount of time scheduled, and we're going to have uh, our legislative liaisons, Dina Horst and Jim Porter, are going to lead us in a discussion as we look at a legislative agenda. Uh, and uh, they did send out a draft of legislative priorities uh, that was included in one of our documents last week. I don't remember which one it actually was included in, but it's a two page document and it's titled Draft Legislative Priorities, Kansas State Board of Education. So Jim, I don't know if you're up first or you're gonna get us started off. Yeah, that, uh, that was in the list of supplemental materials sent to us on the 4th of December, if you wanna find it that way. Uh, we're gonna approach this uh, several different or, or in about two or three or three or four different uh, kind of chunks uh, this this morning. First of all, uh, most of the uh, document uh, is a repeat of the things that we approved last year. Uh, and if you'll look at the page down it, on the second page, it says other issues to be considered. Those were not on our legislative agenda last year, but there are things that have been suggested. Uh, most of the uh, items above that line were approved uh, unanimously by the Board of Education last year, but there were some exceptions. And uh, whenever we made the presentation, we uh, actually, uh, if you'll remember, uh, Steve Roberts, uh, Steve, you uh, asked uh, for those few items that did not have unanimous support from the board, you asked that when we made the presentation that we made that fact known, and we did. Uh, because, uh, you know, if, you know, if this is, this is one of those political things, if we get six votes, it's the, it's the position of the board. But it's different, you know, if it's not the unanimous position of the board, I think that it is responsible to, uh, to make that clear. There are just about three or four, there are actually three changes uh, on the uh, first uh, part of the document. And if you'll go down about two thirds of the uh, page, the first page and see the one that says support the goal of moving toward the first 15 credit out tuition free at, during high school. Last year that, that that's been changed slightly because last year that said moving toward the Regents goal. Now I was told by people and I, and I'll check this out before we actually submit this, but I was told by some people that attend the board of Regents meetings, that that is not on their goal list for this year. So I took out the Regents goal if that's not appropriate, but, uh, and then we need to discuss whether or not that should still be our goal. And then the next one directly under that was support the reinstatement of high density at risk waiting last year that said basically don't let it expire well it's expired so we need to deal with that uh, and on the second page actually the first bullet point opposes uh, infringement of the state board of educators responsibility to determine statewide curricular standards and establish high school graduation requirements for uh, for example, yeah, yeah, I lost my spot. For example, computer science and financial literacy, and then 
we added the word among others because there are other things that come up. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about diversity yesterday. I'm sure that's going to come up and other things like that. Things that we are perfectly willing and capable of doing uh, without legislation. So, uh, so those are the changes. Uh, those are the only three changes in that first. Uh, and uh, Madam Chair, uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, let uh, Dina expand on anything, and then we need to actually go and start making some decisions. So, Dina, it's all yours. Well, um, are we going to just uh, vote on the... Um, I don't have anything additional to say about those particular ones, if that's what you're referencing. Um, I think we could go ahead and, and um, maybe approve those, um, or if there are ones that people want to pull out, they can. Um, <laughs> Might or do you I'm want me to go on to the other issues? Well, let's let's look at. I, I would think the first thing we need to do is go through the the first ones, the ones that we agreed on last year. And uh, might and I, I make a suggestion, Jim? You you are the chair. You get to do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, we might just go through through the ones that we approved previously and kind of chunk them. Uh, take a chunk of four or five of them and uh, see if we've got any concerns on any of them um, and then kind of reach a consensus and then move on to the next chunk. Uh, I don't think we need to go through them one by one. If there's within a chunk of four or five, if there's concerns, we could, we could pull uh, one out that there might be a concern about. That's, okay. Go ahead. That's kind of what I thought we might do. And when it comes to the other ones, we'll have much more detailed discussion. Okay, uh, Michelle has a question or comment. Michelle Dabrowski. Okay. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just, so uh, if we're gonna take about four at a time or five at a time and go down, one uh, one question almost contradicts itself. It's like on the first page and then on, it's continued under other issues to be considered. And I, I don't, I, maybe we just need to get, because it's just one sentence, maybe we just need to get into the, the weeds of what they're talking about. But it says, uh, um, supports, concept of public private partnerships for the purpose of meeting student needs because obviously we accredit private schools and public schools but then it says opposes efforts to divert funds from public schools to non-public educational options and I, I i guess i'm trying to figure out if that's it almost contradicts itself but maybe we just need to go into what that what that what we mean by that because i i'm i'm just it just almost sounds like it's uh where we want that public private partnership to meet the students' needs, because we obviously know that the parents, except because we have kids that have families that have one student in a private school and the other two are in public school. I have a friend that, that a very good friend of mine that 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 just works well for her family. So I'm, it, it meets those students' needs based on that particular child. So I'm just trying to figure out what we mean by that. I guess I just need more, and we can get to that if we're going at four at a time or five at a time. Um, yeah. It just it almost sounds like it contradicts itself. One of, them, one of them deals with uh, educational partnerships. The other one deals with funding. They're actually, I see them as two different issues. When you, okay, when you talk about educational partnerships, I think I understand what you mean, Jim. But just to clarify, you're not necessarily talking about schooling. You're talking about somebody, let's say the Wichita Public Schools has a partnership with uh, Textron Aviation as far as internships right. and that type of thing. So you're referring to something more like that? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Does that help clarify that, Michelle? Or we have like a, like some, even through the pandemic, I mean, we've obviously um, used churches and different, yes. different means to, um, uh, to, to get the, the schooling, like for, for Wi-Fi and for kids to go in. I mean, we obviously have to look at all avenues and all angles. So we need to make sure that we're, you know, we're looking at everything, I guess, on that and making sure Absolutely. we're not. Absolutely. When we're talking about private entities, they're more from a point of view of businesses than and corporations rather than 
um, educational institutions. It might be educational if we're talking about post-secondary, but um, other than that, we're not talking about um, um, private elementary or high school and when we're talking about public-private partnerships. Okay, hey, Jim, you want to go ahead yeah, and start look on counting it? Look at the, take, take a few minutes and read the first four through supports the ongoing work of recommendations of School Mental Health Advisory Council. The first four, are there any concerns with the first four? Madam Chair. The second I'm reading. Um, okay, uh, Ben. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm used to work group setting all, I went in that mode, so I almost started speaking without being acknowledged, sorry. Um, is, is there a reference to the fact that the work of the bullying task force is now part of the school mental health advisory? They've merged, I mean, we've kind of merged the, the, the level of that, and I don't, I, I, you, it's just in and around, and it's more of a formatting and, and the messaging thing, so that's, that's not anything, I support both. Well, and we have, you know, the School Mental Health Advisory Council certainly is doing the work on bullying, but has not been approved yet by the board. And we will, I would assume uh, the board will also want that to go to uh, some legislative committees too. So um, I don't know if you want to change wording to that or not. Jim, what do you think? Mm -hmm. It's uh, immaterial to me. I think that I understand that. I just I understand the point. Uh, the well, we, uh, mental we health. We talked about that, um, but I think we decided to kind of leave it as it's written, and um, we can adjust that in visiting with with. Um, with legislators themselves as because we haven't approved it yet. So um, if you will give us the leeway of adjusting language to include the work that the mental health advisory committees or councils done, I think um, if you, give us the opportunity to, to craft that maybe a little differently so it covers more what is currently occurring. Um, we, can, we can deal with that, but it's more the concept than, um, than the specifics, specific language, I think. It's very important to address bullying. Uh, for those of us that were at the uh, uh, hearings last year, there was a great deal of discussion uh, and actually pushback from the legislators, even those that support education uh, in relation to uh, accountability. What we heard yesterday from Myron and Kent, I think was a direct response to that because they, uh, there's evidently, I mean, there appears to be a great deal more accountability and reporting uh, now. So uh, how we say it uh, is not as important as that we do say it, that we are still supporting the work, the ongoing work uh, relating to bullying. So however we say that, I think, I think Dina's right. We you know we can craft that however he wants us to, but but that needs to stay on the front burner. Mm, well, and, and the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Task Force are what has driven the work of the uh, from the School Mental Health Advisory Council. So uh, it still is true. Um, bullet four does refer to uh, the work and recommendations of the School Mental Health Advisory Council, including suicide prevention and awareness. 
uh, we could add and bullying in there if you want to. Uh, Randy, you have a comment? Madam Chair, if I don't know if the public is able to follow along. Uh, I don't know if they would have downloaded the materials. Would you like for me to post what you're discussing so if anyone's watching, they can they can watch it, or or do you assume that they uh, they have the materials in hand? Your we, choice. We need to be as transparent as possible, so yes. make it as easy as possible. I'm I'm happy to post those and highlight those as you discuss them, but I didn't want to do that if you didn't want yeah. that to occur. It, I if, think that we do if we do that, board members. I'm fine. If you have a question or a comment, you're going to have to put it in chat because uh, I won't be able to see all of your faces when it, we go to share mode, which is fine. So if you've got a comment you want to make, just put it in chat. All right. Okay. Based on the discussion we've had, are we okay with the number with the first four? We will eventually at the end vote on these. Uh, so look at the next four advisory council. Uh, which is tobacco 21, one, two, three, through, through supports all efforts to reduce opioid epidemic in Kansas. For the next four. Comments? Again, put it in, put it in chat if you have a comment. That is so I can acknowledge you. Whoop, we're back on line. Um, I can jump back and forth so the public can see it and then. Okay, that um, works. This is helpful. Okay, the second four, any questions? Uh, I guess my question is any idea where we are with the stop arm, school bus stop arm violation information? I know that got stalled last year. Got stalled in committee last year. Uh, and uh, I do know that I've, I haven't had conversations, but others have had conversations with a, a chair of, an, of another committee that may be responsible for that. And the chairman is very interested in this House committee. I won't identify it because I haven't had that conversation yet, but the chairman of that committee that could be uh, a relevant committee is interested in re revising that. So, uh, I'm pretty sure that it will be reintroduced. Okay, good. Any questions, comments on those four? Ben Jones? Where are we at on the Tobacco 21? Uh, since it's federal and put in place, where is that at now? Well, I know that it stalled in committee and largely because the pandemic kind of took over. So that particular committee, Judiciary Committee, is extremely inundated with a lot of bills. So they, um, that one was one they heard, but they didn't actually work it. And I would assume that it may come back. But didn't didn't the FDA pass rules regarding that? So it's it's law now? Well, sometimes state law picks us up and puts them in our statutes too. So it doesn't hurt yep. to have them in our books. And we added flavorings and I don't think that's in the law. So as that information comes about, uh, we might, and I know Craig is listening too, might want to make a particular concern to keep the board informed on that one. Yep. Some interest on that. Yeah, and if it is covered uh, by federal law, uh, then uh, we'll find out and remove it if it's not, if, if it is no longer relevant. Well, and if the intent is to not put it in our statutes, um, sometimes that occurs. That's kind of a, a desire of the chair almost to 
rather than, um, and it may be law enforcement too saying it needs to be in our, our books. So it makes it a little less controversial for them to, to enforce it locally. So that may just be things we'll have to find out but I don't think it hurts for it to be in our, on our list. So we can check that out. Okay, I wanna to go to the next four. Okay, starting with a juvenile justice oversight, one, two, three, four, and through. Support using appropriated, but the, the special education underfunded which was, which likely is not going to happen this year. <laughs> no. But last year there was money available. I mean, there was money available and so. Okay, these are those four that are highlighted on the screen. The reinstatement of high density, um, again, as Jim mentioned last year, that was one that was going to be worked and uh, got kicked out as a result of uh, the pandemic, so. Are we assuming it will be worked this year? Or do we know, Jim? I know the legislature will be different, but. We don't know, but that's, uh, that's very important to some school districts. Absolutely. So any questions on any of these four board members? And the one that says support the goal of moving toward 15 hours, that's not saying do 15 hours next year. That's saying, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's, that, that is, that concept is very important to some members of the House and Senate. Uh, and I think that there's some, some good, there is some good support in some people in leadership areas. So, uh, so I think it's important for us to say that. Uh, Randy. Uh, I don't know, Madam Chair, if you or Jean would like to speak from the coordinating council perspective, but I know the coordinating council uh, talked a little bit less about the first 15 as a priority, not that it's not, and a little bit more of the of what Wichita USD 259 had requested last year about being able to pay. So I don't know if you wanna comment on that or not, either one of you. Yeah, there was a bill that was uh, being presented and I, you never know, but likely on track to pass, but uh, about allowing a local district to pay for a certain amount of credit hours. Um, you know, what they could do if they did that is they could look around at the various entities in their area to see really basically who they get the best price from as far as credit hours. So uh, that was, Bill was viewed fairly favorable and Craig or Randy can correct me if I'm wrong here. And I did check with 259. Uh, they are interested in uh, trying to get that bill passed again. They have a program they're using where they'd like to be able to do that. So uh, that is something that they are going to continue to pursue on their end. Um, Craig or Randy, anything? And then I'll go to Ann. Okay. okay. Ann Ma. Oh, Randy, did you have something? No, I, I think one, one certainly has a dollar amount to it. The 15 hours, I believe, was around $25 million, I think, uh, with some kind of established per credit hour. The other has no price tag other than what the local districts would spend out of their all, already allocated money. So I don't know how that plays into how you want to look at it, but just to, it was just some point of reference. And Yeah, I, I think it's important for equity that we pursue the 15 hours for every eligible student in the state and not do this piecemeal district by district. So those who have the money can do it and those who don't have the money can't do it. it it's just setting up and I can see why the legislature wanted to do that. It gets it out of their hair and it, it makes them use general fund money, but it certainly sets up another scenario where you're gonna have the haves and have nots with access to these college hours. So I think it's really important that we keep on the table that we make um, college, free college uh, hours 
accessible to every student across the state. And don't let them off the hook. Yeah, I'm still very supportive of this goal that we have here as it breeds. Um, I don't want to see that come off. I agree. Yeah. Um, and once, and once they get their nose under the tent, if you will, like passing a bill just for Wichita because they want to do it, then that'll be it. They'll go, well, go do what Wichita does. So I think we need to hold firm on this equity from an equity standpoint. Thank and you. I, yeah. And I don't know whether, you know, I, I don't know. It, this is true, but the person that was my source for some other things from, from the Board of Regents indicated that there was concern among community colleges on equity uh, to follow up what, what Ann was talking about. Uh, and they indicated that they thought that maybe there was corporate support for this in Wichita that would not necessarily be available in Hamilton. Well, and that is true. There is corporate support for that in Wichita. So, yes. Well, there was. I don't know if there still is. Well, I don't have any objection whatsoever for them doing that. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, that's it's it's one thing for them to do that. And it's another thing for it to be part of our legislative priorities. And as Ann said, we need to uh, we represent all kids in Kansas. Yeah. So I do think we need to continue with that one. Michelle put in the chat as far as the one on the opioid epidemic. She put in there about meth has recently moved into first place in our crisis here in Kansas. So maybe we need to address heroin, meth, and opioid. Michelle, you want to add anything else to that? No, I was just, I was just giving that information from um, some legislators as far as uh, uh, that information. So maybe that, that's something that we need to look at our top, our top priority and go down from there, I guess, is make, make sure we're addressing that the one that's the most, uh, the most current and the most recent as far as our um, crisis here in Kansas. Uh, isn't there an opioid task force or something? Are you on that, Michelle? I am, I am not. Uh, I am. Well, what, what? And all of that is an issue. It's been an issue for a long time. Um, I think the opioids are more of a concern because physicians will um, prescribe those for pain. And a lot of athletes, high school athletes, have become hooked on opioids in the past, and I think that's part, been part of our, our concern. Um, when you talk about meth and heroin, all of those things have been available to kids for quite a while and have been an issue. So we can, we could add other drugs, other illegal drugs to, to the list as well, if you'd like. That certainly wouldn't concern me at all. I think we were just trying to put a focus on, on an issue. That, How does that, it how does this say The task force is prescription drugs and opioids. So it kind right. of pulls, pulls those out for yeah. special attention, I guess. But How does this sound? And, and Michelle, how does this sound? Supports all efforts to reduce the opioid and other controlled substances epidemic in Kansas. Would that cover it? Yeah, that sounds good. Is that there any objections to that? That will that would work. Did you get that, Peggy? She's nodding yet. Peggy did because I don't have a pen. <laughs> okay, are we good with those? The last four on that page. Okay, wait a minute. We got a question from Ben. It's back to the, the 15 hours. Um, I know we're on the cable coordinating council, but as part of that, I don't want to leave the private colleges out of the cover that, that availability as well. 
I know we're talking about cable and community colleges, but part of that equity piece is the private colleges. A lot of my schools utilize the local college in their community for that, for some of those services. Well, I think a lot of this, what happens, in anybody, and Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody would be eligible, any, any institution. Uh, a lot of it would amount to who's going to give the local school district the best deal financially. So uh, I know when I had experience even working in school district, it was depending upon which local entity provided the best deal. And some of them were the private institutions and some of them were public, some of them were community colleges. Randy, is that pretty accurate? That is correct. It would be any accredited higher uh, institution of learning that the school district sought to partner with. We were just talking about KBOR and community colleges exclusively, and I want to make sure that we got the privates in there as well. Yeah, that would be inclusive. And Well, as I recall, when we had our legislation drawn up last time, we had a set rate. And if you were going to do this, you were going to accept that rate. It wasn't a, everybody go negotiate something with whatever college you want. Um, we, we put it out there so we would know what the cost was and what would be provided, i.e. would they get books, would they get tools, what came with it, and what did you have to accept. So anyway, we might want to have a team of folks get together and kind of nail down what we're thinking about again, drag that legislation out and see if we still support it. I mean, this is conceptual and that's fine, but when we get down to the to the details, I think that's important to say, we're not gonna give one college this much an hour and that college another amount. It's gonna be, here's the plan. Yeah, I, I think you'll have to decide as you go through these, as Ann mentioned, the level of detail you wanna get into now versus once legislation's been proposed. But she is correct, and, and, and I, I, if I misspoke, and I, I apologize. So there would be a, a defined dollar amount, and that's how the legislature knows how much to appropriate. But if I'm sitting in McPherson, for example, there are three colleges that I can use that are local. McPherson College, Central Christian College, and Hutchinson Community College, all of which have campuses in McPherson. I would choose one of those at the same price point uh, that the legislature allotted. So. And then the institution can decide whether or not to accept it. That is correct. It, it's, it's a done they, right. They would have to decide whether they would they would find that amount acceptable, but it'd be a set amount that the legislature actually would set. Okay, let's go to the next four. Okay, the, last, the, the other four on that page, uh, and, and then I want to go back. Yeah, after I thought of this, Michelle, we're talking about, when we talk about public-private partnerships, it's more like uh, the partnerships with the Chambers of Commerce uh, and other organizations like that and uh, that are interested in our career and tech process where we are providing internships, where we're providing job shadowing opportunities, uh, where we're providing those sorts of things. I see that unrelated to the other one. Uh, but that's, you know, if, if we are going to successfully implement our individual plans of study, we're going to have to have those partnerships uh, so that uh, students can get real-time, uh, real-world experiences. Does that make sense? Okay, those are the four that we have we're going to discuss now. Okay, back on to screen. So comments on those four or questions. Michelle? Oh, we're talking the last four on uh, page on one. On the first page? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I, always yes. still have, I always still have questions on the um, early childhood and kindergarten readiness as far as uh, pinpointing down what that what that means. I know there's, there's, it's broad as far as we're, we're trying to, I know what we're trying to do on that, but I always have questions on that. So, um, and I know when that comes up for a vote, I'm usually the lone or not lone vote against some of that stuff. So I, I just want to let you know that I still have reservations on some of that um, as far as even with, with Kisa on that uh, for, forcing schools or having schools 
focus on kindergarten readiness. So I just want to make that point known when we're um, when that gets uh, goes over to for legislation. Um, but I have reservations on some of the, some of the stuff that, regarding that. So thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, under those circumstances, Michelle, whenever we make the make this presentation, uh, that will be one of those areas where we say this is not a unanimous when it comes to the board. Yeah, I and mean, I'm sure it always seems like it passes at least six votes. I just want to make sure I'm that they're aware I have some reservations on that on kindergarten readiness. And on the other side, I strongly support it, but you know, we we both have our positions, and that's why we were elected. You know, so that's that's yeah. fine. All right. Uh, that's the only question. That's the only concern I had with those four. Anybody else on those four questions or comments? Steve Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a word of support on Michelle's position. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be here next year, but um, the focus on kindergarten readiness should not be from the standpoint of building our schools to welcome three and four year olds into our schools. The focus from my perspective should be to help families do what they can do to help prepare their three and four year olds. So there's a little, there's a little nugget here that isn't well understood about what we want from the public in terms of getting our kids ready for kindergarten. I think there are a lot of people in education who think, well, we just expand down to three and four year olds. We want to have them coming into our buildings almost. That's the wrong perspective. So in support of Michelle, I just want to frame this as our efforts from Topeka and across the state to help families prepare the three and four year olds should be just that. So I'll go back to the first talking point I ever floated. You don't necessarily have to go to teacher's college in order to be able to help children learn. Thank you very much. Randy? Uh, when we went out and, of course, did the original tour and then we did the reunion tour, what Brad and I found is, is exactly what Steve said, but I want to nuance it even a little bit more, Mr. Roberts. They said, we want every student to arrive to kindergarten social, emotionally, and academically ready. We don't care. In fact, we would support parents doing that. We, if it's faith-based, we're fine with it. If it's community-based, we're fine with it. We just want the community to get students ready. Uh, so it's all of those efforts is the way that they present it to us. Uh, and I think that's, that's how we would still as an agency, um, try to try to give that advice. Yes, parents, churches, private schools, public schools, all the above, whatever that community uh, wants. If you look at, for example, Renwick, they approach that much differently than Coffeyville approaches that because their communities have asked different uh, outcomes of their communities. So, Good and I, thank you. I think if you read the statement, it really doesn't indicate, I mean, maybe there's some, uh, when you're reading it, because of what we do, we're thinking in, in um, the vein of our school districts are going to, impose early childhood and kindergarten readiness on every child by having them come to their buildings. But it just simply says it supports opportunities to expand early childhood readiness and kindergarten readiness. So that can be a broad, um, can be Interpreted, I interpret it as including working with parents who want to um, keep their children at, at home, for example. They don't send them to school until the, uh, the law says that they have to have them in kindergarten or first grade. So 
I think it includes, I feel it includes families, but that's, I'd always read it in that manner, that school districts would help parents gain those skills so that they are in partnership. So anyway, just, just a statement and a thought. Okay, thank and you. I also see this as, a, you know, like Randy said, it, how you get this. Like, I've got two preschool aged grandsons. They're, they live in two different states. They are both in preschool and they're both in faith based preschools. That, that's fine. Uh, where others are, you know, want to stay at home. Uh, we got other programs that help parents if they want to. None of them are required. Uh, I just think we need to look at all aspects of that, but, I, but, but I'm more concerned with parents that don't have resources and how we can help them uh, prepare their children for success. That's just a little philosophy that didn't have anything to do with this. Any other comments about those four before we move to the next page? And by the way, Steve, I don't disagree with what you said. I think that uh, that in a perfect world, uh, that is a parental responsibility. Uh, and have no issue with, with your statements. Everything above, other issues to be considered. Both of these deal with our core responsibilities. Steve. I think we lost the chair. <laughs> we lost the chair. The, the, the earthquake may have taken out the chair. I got kicked <laughs> off. Trying to get back on. I just Janet, saw, I, Janet I just, do you want to take take over the discussion? Okay, I guess I, so that means me. On. I think I believe I believe Steve. I saw you raise your hand, Steve. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> uh, might, might you think about giving just a little bit more responsibility for teacher licensure to local boards? I'm not saying hand anything over. I'm not saying abdicate your responsibilities, but going forward as we try to hopefully simplify the bureaucracy, might uh, local boards be invited to have a greater voice in who should be in a classroom and who shouldn't. Um, part of my philosophy has been, instead of relying on a system of credentials so much, let's rely a little more on who's good at it. Let's do some evaluations. Let's have multiple measures for our teachers. Let's have, uh, not only test scores as being some part of evaluation, but ask the students who the good teachers are and have peer review and get the parents involved, have the multiple measures. And with that, I would just like to uh, suggest that perhaps local school boards should have a little more responsibility in saying who can and cannot do the job well with, you know, just seeing who's doing a good job in their local environment. That's all. Randy? Madam Vice Chair, Steve, Steve, would you see that then as a role of the state board, though, or the legislature to discuss that? I, I would. I mean, clearly, we want licensed teachers. We want competent, licensed professionals in the classroom. There are functions that have to be from the state, from the high level. Background checks come to mind. We can't just let anybody waltz into the classroom. On the other side of this ledger though, we have a lot of folks with their credentials. You know what? Teaching is not the easiest thing to do well. 
and some teachers are just not that great at it, and yet they get to keep their job because they have their credentials. When there's a teacher shortage, especially, there's a lot of emphasis that we need all hands on deck, which we do, especially now with the conditions we have from the virus. My point is, ultimately, we need to evaluate who's good at it and pay them more and quit treating teachers as clerks. You probably heard me say that about 50 times over the last eight years. Teachers are not clerks. We need to make them more professional in every way. And without getting too far afield, because I have a relationship now with uh, a woman from China, I'm learning a lot about how revered teachers are in China. They're absolutely respected. We could learn some lessons there. I, I think my point, Steve, was I think, though, you're saying let that be a, a discussion between the state board and the local board, not necessarily a legislative position. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, as as Jim Porter would suggest, being open and transparent and having great lines of communication, as well as the other folks on this board who have advocated that. Um Quit making everything Topeka centric and let local folks weigh in with a little more emphasis, with a little more um, strength in their voice to say, okay, we, we need this person to be welcomed in this room. Maybe they don't have all their credentials. They haven't jumped through every hoop. I mean, that's been an emphasis since I've gotten to this board. How do we knock down barriers? How do we welcome people who are just naturally good at it? And I think inviting the local folks to weigh in is, is a good idea. And Ma? Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think, you know, we have some opportunities set up um, in the law and we have worked with local districts who wanted to develop, you know, a teacher training um, like in Kansas City and then we opened it up to others. So I think they're is some opportunity for local boards. Um, I think if, if um, teachers who shouldn't be in the classroom aren't removed, then that's something that we need to address. And I think we talked about it a bit when we approved the latest uh, round of training for leadership in schools. I think some of them just don't know how to, to manage and coach and then you know get rid of, of the people who shouldn't be in the classroom. But I, I agree that this is not a legislative issue. It's something I think should be taken up by our um, teacher um, vacancy committee and, um, and addressed. I know I mentioned, uh, Steve and I had talked about last, uh, last earlier this year, probably, or uh, no, I think it was actually last year. Could we provide some path to teaching that didn't require a master's degree or, you know, something less than 30 hours. And I don't think that's been taken up yet, but I think there probably are more ways we can get good people in the classroom, but I think we want to keep that in house and let the legislature know that teacher licensure is our bailiwick and not theirs. But I think it should be a topic of discussion for um, our committee that we have going. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Jean. Um, I, I serve on the teacher vacancy and supply committee and I, I like the language as it is uh, right now. Uh, I would be, uh, be concerned if we implied through the language of our legislative priorities that we were open to having um, input from the legislature or um, organizations or other um, Area, other people that we have not already incorporated. We, we do get input from um, local districts um, and, and we do afford a lot of opportunity for people to uh, request a licensure um, through a variety of streams. I think uh, Dr. Watson has mentioned there's 19 different ways to, to gain a, a teacher license in Kansas. So uh, I, I just wouldn't want to see us imply that that we wanted to expand uh, the ability of 
uh, other organizations or individuals to um, be involved in our licensure pro process. I think that's uh, our, in our bailiwick and we should uh, keep it at that point. So, thank you. Is there any further discussion on any of these issues? I w I'd like to say something before we go any further. Uh, I, I simply wanted to bring up the early childhood issue because I, I raised my hand, but apparently Kathy didn't see me. Uh, I feel strongly about the early childhood thing. And I think we need to always remember uh, everyone has opportunities, the parents to do whatever they want to do. And I recognize that, but it, it's different in your low socioeconomic areas, which I represent. And so many of them do not have the ability or the capabilities of, of teaching that early childhood. So that's why it's so important that we continue to do the early childhood, plus it was in our vision. So therefore I'd like to support that. Now we can continue on, thank you. Okay, at this time I had intended to have us approve that part of the process. I think probably we ought to wait for the chair. Uh, you want to go on and review the next section, Jim, or do you well, want let me, to? Uh, let me ask some questions about that first. Uh, you know, it, it's best for the leg. Uh, I'm thinking out loud now, so uh, it's best uh, if we can be as unanimous as possible. Uh, and so I'm going to, as I look, I didn't hear any major objections to anything except. Uh, support opportunities to expand early childhood and kindergarten readiness and then uh, the one on licensure uh, when we get ready to to vote perhaps we should pull those out and vote on them separately unless there are others that you want pulled out so we can say it's a stronger voice if we are unanimous so if we can say we support tobacco legislation, we support uh, the opioid uh, group, we support anti-bullying efforts. So we can say that, that we're unanimous on that and then vote on the others to give those member, our members who are concerned with those issues the opportunity to express themselves. Quite frankly, they'll still probably pass, but then we can also... Uh, uh, report as Steve asked us to do last year to say these are the unanimous decisions of the state board and these are not. Uh, so, but I think we all tend need to be here before we vote, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Okay, Jean Clifford. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just think that even where we're not unanimous, we're, we're not unanimous on fairly minor points uh, of these rather than, than the general idea. So I, I would hope that um, we can take that into consideration because I wouldn't want uh, anyone, the legislature or any, any other individuals to think that we are divided um, greatly on any of these issues. They're all important to uh, maintaining uh, the quality education that we want to provide in Kansas. Welcome back. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. I got booted off and my Wi-Fi totally went down. I guess it was the earthquake earlier. I don't know. So uh, I had to reboot my Wi-Fi. Sorry, I missed the conversation, but I was trying all three devices. So well, all right, we, sorry about we that. actually suspended the discussion and we're talking about you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, maybe my, I thought maybe my retirement just started a little early. I defended you, Kathy. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Janet. I'm glad you stood up for me. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll let you continue with your... Okay, we are through uh, with the first part of it and down to other considerations, and these we need to discuss individually. Right. I, would, I think that sounds good. And the first one, based on what we did yesterday, I'll need, we'll need advice from Randy whether or not it's... Uh, whether or not we actually already have that authority.
the authority, Jim, to, to do what? Uh, to, it's uh, support adjusting statutes to include more flexibility and respond to natural disasters, including the current as it relates to required hours. Do we already have that? You currently have the new authority in, any, in a state of emergency to waive the hours as you did yesterday. So is that statement even necessary? Unless you wanted to broaden it over what you, uh, the authority you currently have. The authority you currently have is pretty broad. If a governor declares a state of, a state of emergency for any reason, you then have the authority to waive the 1116 hours. So my question is then, is that even necessary? I guess I would say, I don't know that it is. We already have the authority on isolated incidents like uh, what happened in Greensburg several years ago. We've got that authority. And uh, so if the governor declares a state of emergency and either an isolated or an overall thing, we have that authority. Would that be right, Randy? Well, that is cor that's correct, Madam Chair. The reason why I suggested it was we really have only started using the new language and whether we found would find there was something that needed to be added a tweak to it as it would give us the ability to say this works, this doesn't, but it's not that big of a deal to me because we've been using it uh, for the pan for this pandemic. But if it's specific to this pandemic, we might I haven't seen the language, so that. That was um, part of my concern is whether it was would be workable in a general sense if we came up with a, another issue, it's more of a statewide issue. Most of the things that we've dealt with in the past have all been kind of geographically centered in some location of the state rather than across the entire state because they were literally natural disasters. But anyway, it, whichever. And I'm thinking if we already have the authority, let's not muddy the water by asking for something we've already got. I would agree with Jim. Jean Clifford. I, I agree with Jim too. I, I would be a little bit concerned by asking for it that it would also, um, we could generate some opposition to it and um, perhaps, you know, restrict the, the type of authority that we've already exercised. So that there could be somewhat of a downside to, to specifically including it. And Sometimes be careful what you ask for. Yeah. And you're correct in putting it there. Someone could come up with something that we'd prefer that they did. Because I do know that there are individuals who are concerned about the kind of, of instruction kids received. And so that might morph into something more negative, I'm fine with leaving that one off. Yeah, and I didn't, you know, I didn't realize the authority we had until we exercised it yesterday. So I don't think Dina and I either one, at least I didn't understand that until yesterday when we actually uh, made some decisions. So I, I'm going to suggest uh, without, I'm going to suggest that we remove that for consideration. And I, would suggest we remove it as well. So have kind of a consensus on that. Okay, all right, all right. Let's go to the next one. 
This one might be somewhat similar. I don't well, know. A little different. Now this this d d relates directly to the time frame for evaluations and the fact that it was difficult to do evaluations when people were not at school this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, and that was suggested by somebody. They, uh, these were all, the ones that are on here were all suggested uh, to one of us uh, by, by some of our members, so. Uh, Randy, what are the current uh, restrictions? Do we have some flexibility that folks aren't using? Uh, thoughts on this one? Not in terms of the statutory deadlines for evaluations. Local districts always have the prerogative to negotiate agreements of lessening what makes up that evaluation like how many times you're observed or um, the process of, of collaborating. So that, that happens at a local level and that can be changed as I'm sure many were during the pandemic. What was not changed is that the evaluations of, um, of staff still had to be done based on the statutory dates. That was not waived by the legislature. Uh, Craig, you might have something you wanna to add to this. No, I think, I think Randy covered it pretty well. Have you been hearing from districts on concerns on this, either one of you? I've had districts call and question if any of the dates have changed and so forth, uh, but not, uh, I don't know that I would label it as concerns other than, okay, we'll have to do things a little different than we usually do. Randy, any concerns from your soup advisory group on this? Okay. No, it hasn't really been raised as much of an issue. I think we heard a little bit about it, um, oh, you know, in the early fall. But compared to other issues that were brought forward, this this was not a major issue, or, or, or at least not major enough that, that Craig and I heard it over and over. This also might be one of those ones, be careful what you ask for. Just my thought. Jim? Yeah, I don't have any problem with the, I, I, I don't want to put anything on this list that may create more problem, more unintended consequences than we uh, anticipate. Well, when you talk about personnel evaluations, there's always someone who has some idea of something they may need to impose. So just the idea of mentioning personnel evaluations may be a, an issue and sort of like the one before. Um, it can bring about some a bill to do something with personnel evaluations that we had no intention of having a, occur. So, well, based on our discussion, I have no objection to removing this one either. And I certainly do not either. Thoughts? You okay with removing it from the list? I am. See, one thumbs up. Another one. Another one. Okay. All right. I think most people are okay with removing that. Okay. The third one. The next one is a big deal. Uh, this is something that, uh, as a matter of fact, Dean and I are meeting with the legislative lobbyist uh, on Friday of this week. Uh, and uh, there is the belief that there's going to be a significant effort to uh, in this legislative session to divert public funds into private schools uh, through uh, through either vouchers or or scholarships and that sort of thing and so our th this was recommended by the uh, by the legislative lobbyist it's going to be a priority for them and uh, 
typically we have uh, uh, in the past, uh, the, the board has, has uh, supported public funds for public schools. Uh, and so that's the reason this is on there. And uh, it's, it's uh, a major concern to numerous organizations and people that support public schools. Okay, um, questions, comments from board members on this. Michelle? Thought I was unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that, that is going to be a big one, um, uh, a big issue with a lot of parents, a lot of families, because they're, they're trying to do what's best for their family and they're under these hardships and times. And I'm thinking about into the next one, that, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of, lot of families um, are dealing uh, with, with remote, you know, they asked for back in August, we asked for in-person schooling and thought we were going to get it. And I'm one of those. And, um, and uh, this is not uh, working out as it is for most families. So I, these last two, I'm going to, I'm going to have to say that there's just too many issues and too many gray areas and it's too broad. Um, it, depending on what legislation is talking about, um, I would have to, I would have to say those last two on there, I would have to say that depending on what, what's being tossed around. And I know vouchers isn't necessary. I, I wouldn't say I'm not a big voucher supporter. I'm more of a parent choice and doing what's best for that child and getting them the best education that works for that child, which are my two children as well. Um, the, the remote learning is not, <laughs> is not working out for, for this, for this family. So that would be a, probably a majority of families in Kansas that are, that you're saying 89%, I think, are in person. There's a lot that aren't, aren't in person and, and wanted that choice. There are ones that chose virtual because they didn't want their kid to wear a mask every day at school. That's why they chose virtual. I found that out later on, that that was the majority of kids that stayed home because they didn't want their child to wear a mask. So I'm going into this, I'm going into this probably too much, but those last two, I, depending on what they're talking about, I would, I would have to say I'm, I'm not on board with opposing diverting funds. I'm not opposed to, and then the, the extra, the extra cost that schools are incurring. The governor shut us down in March and without a plan, in my opinion. And so that I'm kind of revved up about this. And so I'm thinking if, <laughs> if the schools aren't getting that, that she received a lot of money, federal dollars, and that needed to go to those schools that to get those kids either back in school or teachers back in school to, to educate in person for the, those who wanted it. And that's all I'll say about that. So I have major issues about the last two, I guess. Thank you. Hey, other comments? Yeah, I want to address the, the, the public funding. This is an equity issue too. In my area, uh, specifically, and probably others in rural, more rural areas, there are not private options. Uh, there, in my in my area, there are no private options. There are some. There's a, it's, you know, the, in Pittsburgh, there are some private options. In Parsons and and in, uh, in Independence, there there are some private options. But for most people in my area, there are no private options. And so, diverting money from public schools to private schools is to the detriment of most of the students in my district. So Jim, I have a question on that. I guess I, I wouldn't necessarily send my kid to a private school. We like the public option in our area. Um, but I, I, even if, even if there could be funding for tutoring, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of lacking in education going on. And, um, and I, I, we're looking into tutoring right now for math and different things like that. And, that that doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a sending a kid to a private school. Just just figuring out the funding so that we can catch these kids up from last year of all the schooling that they've lost. There's a lot of education that's been lost, um, and, and especially in certain areas. And I just feel like we need to look at all of our options for these children that have uh, are lagging and falling behind. And it may be it may be just giving some parents some relief for, for, for catching those kids up, whether it be tutoring or money or something like that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to send my kid to a private school or a private institution. It just means maybe some of that can be done. Uh, you have to pay through it online, but to prove that, I don't know how you do it, but uh, there's just got to be something where we can catch, catch these students up that have, have lagged behind and make them college and career ready where they've, where they've lagged behind based on not being in school and not getting the, 
the proper um, in-person schooling that they deserve. Thank I'm going to go to Randy. He wants to. Ma make Madam a Chair, I apologize. We've got some technical difficulties with the live stream, and I wonder if we could take a break for 15 minutes while we send out a new YouTube link. I don't want anyone to miss the discussion that's going on here. I apologize for breaking okay. in. It is um, 1045. We'll take a break until 11 o'clock. <laughs> 